So, okay, everybody welcome to class. This is um, Dr. Mark Urbaugh here, and he is going to be sharing with us um, from the general college perspective um, about the impact of our college internationally, as well as sort of like the land grant system and um, the whole sort of overview of everything that we do as a college. So I am going to start sharing his PowerPoint slides now, and I'm gonna turn it over. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks so much, Kelly. As Kelly mentioned, my name is Mark Urbaugh, and I'm the director of the International Programs and Agriculture Office, which is located in our College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences. Take another breath at the Ohio State University. And I've been the director of the office since 2010, but affiliated with the office for over 25 years in about every position imaginable in our, our, in our office. Now I'm gonna begin my presentation by uh, just providing you with a brief overview of the IPA office. The, that's not Indian Pale Ale, that's <laughs> the International Programs and Agriculture Office. I'll be referring to it as the IPA office. I'm gonna start off with a, a brief overview. And, um, and, uh, and then uh, what I'm going to do is the main focus of my presentation is gonna be really looking at the the college's involvement in international development projects. Uh, I think Kelly had me originally listed in your 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 mm -hmm. your, your, your syllabus in yeah. your syllabus as I was going to provide an overview of international for the college. Well, I'd need a little bit more than forty five minutes to do that. And um, if you want a complete and comprehensive report of international activities in our college, then what I would refer you to is our IPA website and our, our annual reports. Those provide you with uh, activities that our office runs, that provide you also with activities, not all international activities in the college go through our office, but they're international activities and we've designed this to be, uh, to provide a comprehensive picture so that we can talk about our, what is really an impressive global international footprint of our college. And so, again, that's our, our annual reports if you want more information on, on what the whole college is doing. Now, um, I'm going to be, uh, the way I'm going to approach these, uh, those two purposes uh, is, is by running through those, uh, those objectives there. And I'll try and announce as I shift from objective to objective because I'm going to be moving fast. I hope to be explaining all the acronyms I'll be using if I don't. Jen, just send me a hand signal and I'll, and I'll try and get to that. Whoopsie, that's not what I want to do. I want to stick right there. Okay, I, I think this information is going to be important for you, or at least I hope it's very important for you for several, uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, one, at a very practical level, uh, I hope my presentation contributes to your knowledge of these uh, international events, global events, and thus, you know, hopefully contributes to your, you know, ability to, uh, to uh, handle, uh, you know, uh, your global competencies, improves your global competencies, which is the objective of your what, uh, global, option. global option program. At another level, like it or not, we're engaged in a, in a global economy. Uh, no longer are the actions of any other nation isolated from the actions of another. There's many examples of this. Um, it, we, have, we can go on to various topics ranging from the pros and cons of international trade agreements, like the you might have heard of NAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement. That's being debated right now, an agreement with uh, Mexico and, and Canada, uh, to, to uh, you know, commodity prices that fluctuate in response to global supply and demand. You got a good harvest of soybean down in the Brazil, that's gonna, low, that's gonna increase the supply, that's gonna lower the, the price for it, even for our soybean producers. We can go on to other topics like climate change, we can go on to topics like food security. But all these topics, again, we're not isolated from the acts. Other countries aren't isolated from our actions and vice versa is also true. So. I think enhancing your knowledge of global events and is interactions is important to you and to our country. So if we're to remain competitive and make informed policy decisions. 
Now, uh, regarding the IPA office, the IPA office is an administrative unit uh, affiliated with the dean's office uh, or the vice president for agriculture administration in our college. It's been around since 1955. Uh, we're currently located over on West Campus in Beavis Hall. There's seven people in our office that include myself, the director, the, the campus Peace Corps recruiter, and also the director of the, uh, of the uh, Ohio internship program. Our mission statement, let's see, there we go, is to support the globalization efforts of the college uh, by engaging our faculty and staff in teaching, research, and outreach or extension opportunities. The notion of this notion of uh, partnerships is also important. Our capacity building is also uh, important because we use this as kind of a strategy as we get involved in these international development projects. And what we do is engage our faculty and our staff in these projects to build the capacity of these uh, of our partners overseas. And thereby what we're doing really is helping to internationalize our own faculty and staff. The notion of being a land grant university is also important. I'll be getting into that a little bit more here shortly. Let's see where am I? Some of the uh, main activities we fulfill in our office, and this is just the IPA office, is we coordinate uh, international uh, visitors and, and, and guests. Since September, we've probably had about 48 visitors from many different countries. Um, I just remember the, the two latest groups was a group from South Africa, from the Western Cape in South Africa that came here, uh, four or five people. And um, then we also had a group from Hanan Agricultural University. Did you work with them? Okay. Uh, again, uh, and again, there's probably eight people who came in from Hanan Agricultural University. And so we help coordinate that with the Dean's office or with the other Departments that are, are relevant to the interest of our guests. Of course, we also, uh, Kelly runs the uh, study abroad program through the Office of Academic Affairs in the college, but our office also gets involved in placing graduate students, largely graduate students, uh, in, in some, with some of our international development projects. Of course, we're now looking uh, at how we can engage uh, undergraduates in these uh, programs also. Um, we also, let's see, we also manage long-term degree training programs and short-term technical training programs for, uh, for international students. These are largely people who are funded off some type of project. Right now, uh, uh, funded, you know, we probably have nine graduate students from uh, four different countries in our college that are funded off projects doing master's and PhD programs. And we have, you know, these are funded by USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. U.S. Department of Agriculture has a, a, a component called the Foreign Ag Service, FAS, and they're the ones who are supporting these things. Uh, Be Heard is another project and that, you know, sends out the degree training programs and uh, so there's a number of these and we also host and run uh, Fulbright programs and uh, a number of other projects and programs that we work with. We also uh, coordinate uh, the development of MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding, with uh, other uh, universities around the world. We currently have about 27 active MOUs and we coordinate the development of these MOUs with the Office of International Affairs, which is kind of the overarching body for international at, at the university. And uh, again, MOUs, this is something if a faculty member wants to work in, with another university in South Africa, the University of Pretoria, then what kind of the, the first step in the relationship or the partnership building is you develop an MOU. So our office helps coordinate that. Um, we also have the Ohio Internship Program, um, or what we call the Ohio Internship Program. They placed 420 international interns from 90 different countries uh, last year. 
It's been around for 30 years. It's totally self-funded project. Uh, they're off Kenny Road. They're part of the International Programs and Ag Office, but kind of a separate unit because they are self-funded. They have their own funding mechanism. And then we also have the, the, the Peace Corps, Campus Peace Corps recruiter in our office. Um, uh, Gail has been there a couple years. Um, the Peace Corps recruiter has been in the IPA office since 1974. And it's there for a reason because Peace Corps is always looking for what they call scarce skills. And a lot of folks in, in various uh, agricultural disciplines are considered scarce skill candidates, meaning they can't get enough of them. So uh, again, Peace Corps, if you want to put your global competencies to work, then Peace Corps, I highly suggest to you as, is a, an option where the, the, those things that can be put to work right uh, tomorrow. Okay, we also coordinate with uh, the Ohio State University Global Gateways. Again, this is through the Office of International Affairs. The Global Gateways strategy is to expand the reach and the impact of OSU programs in three strategic countries, India, China, and Brazil. All three of these countries are, are countries where the College of Agriculture had some of the you know, original relationships. Our relationship, and I'll be repeating this, with India goes back to 1955 through our college. Our relationship with Brazil goes back to 1964. Uh, I know we've had faculty going to China ever since Deng Xiaoping, uh, who was a premier over there, opened up China to more, uh, uh, you know, Western, uh, uh, you know, and market-oriented uh, engagements. So again, our college has been there uh, and, and involved with these places for a long time. I sent out a, a memo uh, last year to our faculty trying to pull together because a lot of people, we've got a lot of faculty going over to China. And I, not, like I said, not necessarily through our office. And I think I got 34 responses of people who've been over to China in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I was over in India last year with the department chair of food, agriculture, and biological engineering, Scott Shear. And then, were you down to Brazil this year? Not this year. Not this year. 14, yeah. All right. Uh, wait, no. What is this? This is 18, 16. 16. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the activity that occupies most of our office time is putting together proposals and bidding upon international development projects. And, uh, these projects are competitively bid. The university doesn't give us money, except, you know, I guess I should consider my salary as part of this, uh, uh, as the university giving us money. But uh, these uh, projects uh, are funded by various organizations. One of them is USAID, the Agency for International Development. And uh, the USAID is the development wing of the U.S. State Department. Okay, you have the State Department, you know, the embassies, that's all State Department. Foreign policy is run by the State Department, and USAID is part of the State Department. Um, we also have projects that are funded by the World Bank. We've also had projects that are funded by USDA, FAS, that foreign ag service. So those are the, it will, so we spend a lot of time on these uh, development projects. Now, I'm gonna move on here. What do I mean when I talk about agriculture development projects or international development projects? International development is actually a subset of what some people call foreign aid or foreign assistance. But I say it's a subset because really if you get into foreign aid and you get into foreign assistance, it's a pretty broad group of uh, line items in there, funding line items from everything going from Camp David Peace Accords of 1978 that gives Israel uh, a couple billion and Egypt a billion uh, dollars every year since 1978. That's included in foreign, foreign assistance all the way to disaster and emergency relief. But what I'm call, talking about right now is development. And then agriculture development is a subset of that. And really what I'm talking about here 
are the efforts on the part of developing countries to, to promote the development of lesser developed countries. That's what development aid is there for. Why agriculture development? Because the majority of people uh, in these in, in lesser developed countries are uh, living in rural areas, and the majority of these people depend upon agriculture as their main form of livelihood. 70% of the world's poor live in rural areas, and 70% of these people are women and children. In India, agriculture employs 52% of the labor force. This is in India, today's India. 52% of the labor force engage in agriculture, and 80% of its rural poor are engaged in agriculture. If we were to go over to East Africa, where I just returned from on Sunday, uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, 60 to 80 percent of the labor force is engaged in smallholder agriculture. Thus, the thinking is, is if we can provide some assistance to these countries, to get their agriculture moving forward and be more productive, then this will have ripple effects upon their economies and they will develop. That's the whole rationale and the thinking for this. Now, the, more specifically, the challenge facing all of us is that by 2050, uh, global population is gonna exceed uh, 9 billion. Thus making food security one of the most important challenges and policy objectives of our time. And this is, challenge is particularly relevant in Africa. Uh, I'll just beg your indulgence here. A lot of my examples are going to be coming from Africa because that's where a lot of my experience is. That's actually is. okay because uh, Kayla is going to Ghana. Oh, Kayla's going yeah, to Ghana. Great. We just came back from Ghana. Okay. I'm going to South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going, and, you're both going to South Africa. Mm -hmm. I've been to Ghana. Oh, you've been going. All right. Well, fantastic. And then a few people online. Well, then I don't need to apologize. Tanzania. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, good. Yeah. But, so if, if, we were gonna, if we were going to take this food security challenge, we go to Africa, Africa's population is gonna be two billion by 2050. It's right around one billion as I speak. It's either a little less than that or, or going to exceed that uh, fairly shortly. But uh, one of the things, let's see. One of the things is, is that when we, you consider Sub-Saharan Africa as agriculture certainly is, is the primary form of livelihood. It represents 30 to 40 percent of the GDP of most sub-Saharan African, uh, of sub-Saharan African. It accounts for 60 percent of the export income and thus improving the performance of agriculture is fundamental to developing development in African uh, economies. But there's, there's a, a number of, uh, of things that are, are limiting uh, this, uh, you know, production and the performance of agriculture, a number of things. A couple of them are, is that generally yields of staple crops, uh, and we could extend that to the, the, the animal or livestock production industry, are generally pretty low. For staple crops though, the yields have really not increased since the, the mid 60s. Uh, the, the use of improved varieties, the use of fertilizers are the lowest in the world. And another common problem in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa is that these smallholder farmers, when I talk about smallholder farmers, I'm talking about five hectares, five to 10 hectares or less. Most of these people are not linked to what we call knowledge and innovation systems, meaning they're not linked to agricultural research, new information, and they're not linked to extension systems. Okay. So, oh yes, and there's other demographic trends occurring in Africa that also apply to uh, places in, in South Asia and even some places in Central and uh, North America. These demographic trends are gonna have tremendous impact on development and food security issues uh, in these places. Now my data comes specifically from Tanzania, but it could be easily extrapolated, certainly to Sub-Saharan Africa. Number one is Tanzania's population is going to double and urban population is going to surpass rural population by 2050. That to me is just a real shocking thing. Um, right now, Tanzania is on, on, always on the, on the, on the precipice of, of food security. Most years are, all, are they're okay, but you know, you get a droughty year in there 
and, and they're food insecure and they're importing food. Now you, by 2050, you're gonna have more people in the urban area. Where is their food gonna come from? Second, food consumption is outstripping production. But then the, the, what I wanna to get to is this youth bulge, what they call, and again, this is a, a, a phenomenon throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. 65% of that population right now is under the age of 25. So it, it's really interesting when the leadership over there starts talking about the colonial period, the youth kind of look at this and go, what's the colonial period, man? We're not worried about colonialism. We want to know what's going on. When you go to South Africa, I mean, you heard me talk about apartheid. Well, the, the, the young kids kind of go, hey, man, oh, what's the problem? We don't know apartheid. We, we don't know what you're talking about. All we've seen is the governance that we've received since, you know, uh, South Africa eliminated or got rid of apartheid in 1994. Anyways, so you've got this youth pulse. Then you've got a problem, <clears throat> an economic problem is that the growth in wage jobs is not keeping pace with the number of these young people entering the labor force. <clears throat> and this seems to indicate that you know, for the next 10 or 20 years, these youth are going to be engaged in agriculture, like it or not. And so the, the issue becomes one of what are we doing for youth education? How are we educating youth for careers in the future of agriculture? And this is something, one of the things that we were just discussing when I was over in Tanzania last week is, you know, how do you go about training the youth? They don't have 4-H programs, people, uh, programs to get youth excited about agriculture. They don't have Future Farmers of America. Or what's the new name? FFA. Oh, just FFA. Yeah. I see. <laughs> the National FFA Organization. I see. Yeah. That's the brand now. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. But these programs don't exist there. Agriculture uh, is kind of perceived as a backwater by the youth. I mean, and that's why a young person in, in rural Tanzania, if they get the opportunity to get out of there, they leave. And so how do you make, a, one of the problems is how do you make agriculture productive enough and, and kind of improve the, 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 uh, the, the brand of agriculture so that young people want to stay behind? You go to a, lot of, a number of rural areas in, in Tanzania, and the only thing you find are old people and, uh, and young girls who are pregnant and have been left behind. The guys, they're out of there. And they're going to the capital city and take any job they can find. That's not sustainable. What they need to do is find how we got, we've got to figure out a way to make agriculture productive, link these people in the value chains is so that they remain behind. So those are the, the some of the mega trends that, that are going on there. Now, I'm going to shift my, my gears here a little bit and go to my next up, uh, objective, which is talking about some of the history and current engagement of the college in these agricultural development projects and how we use the land grant university. That's the LGU, the land grant university model uh, to, uh, to frame and extend our efforts. The essence of this land grant university model, and of course, the land grant university model is what we use here in the United States to support agriculture and natural resource management and other activities in the various states. Had, but the essence of this model are its, are its tripartite mission of teaching, research, and outreach, all underneath a university umbrella. And this this model is really the envy of the world. So, so uh, you're I'm, good. Okay. Just letting you know. How much? We're halfway through. We're halfway through. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, and it, it's really the envy of the world because, number one, it's proven to be very successful. And number two, at teaching, research, and outreach, we make every effort to uh, build coordination and linkages between those three. It's not perfect, but we're, well, at least we're, we realize that those three uh, very mission, those three missions need to be integrated. Other countries uh, around the world, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, have what you call a Ministry of Agriculture system. Um, uh, and this is where you've got a Ministry of Agriculture, and in that Ministry of Agriculture you have research and extension, 
and then you have a ministry of education or a ministry of higher education where you have a university that's engaged in doing the teaching of agriculture and probably doing some research. And uh, when I go to different countries, one of the first questions I'm asking with people is I'm trying to get an understanding of how the system works. So I'm asking them, hey, who, who's doing the research? Who's doing the teaching? Who's doing the outreach? Who's talking to who? And what you generally find, unfortunately, is that these three component parts are highly fragmented. And there's very little linkage, even within the Ministry of Agriculture. The research and the extension people aren't talking to each other at all. They're miles apart. And nobody's talking to the local farmers. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great issue. But what we have is, in those countries, is this Ministry of Agriculture system. So I can't go in, we can't go in there and say, hey, what you need to do is reorganize and, and build all the teaching, research, and outreach into the university. That's impossible to do. Uh, so what we really do is we'll, we will focus on improving the, the functioning of those three component parts and also the integration of those three component parts when we get involved in our development projects. That's what I talk about using that land-grant university system to frame our development efforts. Now, um, through the IPA office, the, um, the, the College of Agriculture, uh, Food Agriculture, Environmental Sciences is, uh, has a long uh, history of international engagement, implementing multidisciplinary and multi-institutional programs in the area of agriculture research and extension. And uh, I mean, our office, the IPA office was formed in 1955 to backstop the college's growing engagement in India. And we were asked in 19, actually in 1954, we were asked by the, the, the government of India to work in three different states of India to build land grant university colleges of agriculture. Not university, they were then colleges of agriculture. Complete with the three missions, teaching, research, and outreach. That goes back to 1955, and our office was formed at that time. It actually was one of the first international units on, on campus, if not the first. Um, I should also, I just want to add very quickly, that other land-grant universities, Penn State's, the Purdue's, the Michigan State's, you know, university, all the land-grant universities, or most land-grant universities, uh, have been involved in these international development capacity-building projects too. It's not just Ohio State. And we also had our, our HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, uh, colleges like Tuskegee. We, we worked with Tuskegee in, in Tanzania, uh, North, North Carolina A&T, uh, uh, what's uh, Fort Valley. Mm -hmm. we, we used to have a link with Fort Valley down in Georgia. These are HBCUs. These are the, the, the black land grant colleges. They've also been involved in a lot of these activities overseas too. But since 1955, uh, OSU has been involved in a number of these. And I just put some of these out up there. I didn't put all of them that we've been involved with. Um, and these are, these are what we call kind of institution building projects where we partner with a university or a ministry of agriculture in these countries to build their capacity and strengthen their capacity to do teaching research and outreach and or outreach. And th this is now called by USAID, uh, the, these are called HICD, Human and Institutional Capacity Development Projects. So these names change, just like OSU logo changes. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, the, the whole idea is to extend this land-grant university concept. And I personally believe that these efforts, this is kind of my own personal, is these efforts to partner with these other universities it is fundamental to sustainable development. If we send over technical assistance, somebody goes over to country X, Y, or Z for three weeks to advise on what, uh, on how to raise uh, maize or how to improve uh, 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 hog production or something like that, that's nice. But what's better is to build their capacity, build the capacity of their universities and their ministries to do their own research so that they can solve their own problems and they can train their own next generation. One of the questions I inevitably always get hit up with when I go over to these countries is, what do I think about GMOs? Okay. 
Oh, I just love that one. But I've got a great answer now. And I get off the hook on it right away. So I said, I don't know. What I believe in is I want to work with your university and your country to build its capacity so that you can do your own daggone research and make your own decisions. You don't listen to the Europeans, don't listen to the Americans. I do have an opinion on it, and we can discuss that uh, later on. But that's the fundamental to that sustainable development are strong institutions. And that's just my own personal philosophy uh, that I, I adhere to. Now, where am I going from here? Okay, um, so what I wanna talk about now is I'm gonna go into some details about some of the, the engagements we've uh, been a part of. Uh, some of these I'm gonna be going over relatively quickly. How much time do I have left now? Uh, just over 15. 15, total. okay, good. Yeah. Okay, uh, for, I'm gonna start off with, uh, with Uganda. Um, and we've been involved with Uganda since 1983 with McCary University and their uh, College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. We've also worked with NARO, their National Agricultural Research Organization. And we've also worked with their extension system that is called the National Agriculture Advisory System. Nothing simple anymore. They, they, you know, they just don't call it the extension system anymore. Uh, so we've worked with all three of those land grant uh, mission areas, the teaching, the research, and the outreach. And uh, through various projects, we had a World Bank funded project over there. We had USA projects over there. And um, through those projects, we trained over 70 people at the MS or PhD level. Uh, we had probably 90 Ugandans come over to OSU, but to other, we placed them in other universities to do three months, four months of, you know, very topical training, like learning a research protocol in, in somebody's lab. Our activities right now are really uh, um, focused now on, on supporting our alumni. And I'm, in fact, I'm planning to go over to Uganda here fairly shortly again, because one of the things that I need to do is go over there, touch base with people and see what the opportunities are for collaboration. I'd also say over the, the, the years of our, our collaboration with, uh, with Uganda, probably had over 30 or 40 of our faculty members engaged in, in, in going and working over there. In Kenya, we participated with uh, Edgerton University, and, uh, which, and, and then we've also uh, collaborated with what they call CALRO, Kenya Agriculture Livestock and Research Organization. They just changed their name. And, uh, and in Edgerton, I was just there in December uh, where we, we had a project that we just completed uh, with them called the Trilateral Project for Capacity Building. It was kind of a weird deal in that we were working, uh, it was Ohio State University working with our partner, Punjab Agricultural University in, in, from India and Edgerton to build their capacity to do agribusiness, to do agribusiness outreach. Uh, and I'll be talking a, a little bit more about that here shortly. Again, we probably had uh, 10, uh, 10 faculty members who've been involved in our, our Kenya activities. Um, now coming to Tanzania, yeah, uh, I'm gonna be working using Tanzania as I'm gonna be coming using, describing some of these projects and before I get to our IAGRA project. Um, we've had a, we had a number, we had a, we had a long history, we've been working there since 2002. And uh, our first project there was this Agribusiness Development Center project. Again, um, the, the, the purpose of this was to improve business oriented training at the university. What you find over there is that the universities linkages with the private sector are, are, are not very strong. And that's, a, that's an understatement. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to do is build those linkages with the private sector. And uh, we did that by following kind of this activity model. And uh, in fact, when I first went to the, the, the faculty and said, hey, you know, let's 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 get the work with the private sector and bring them in and have them build closer 
relations. The first response by their faculty at the, the Sokoini University was, they won't be interested. And then some of them started saying, well, if you let the private sector in, maybe they'll want to take over the university. So there was some like fear of capitalism. Um, and, but it's really because people don't know each other because the private sector is rather emergent in some of these countries. But our activity model was we started off with a survey of agribusiness where we got the faculty to go out, we came up with the sampling frame of private companies in three different regions of Tanzania, they set up appointments and went out to talk to people. Asked them, number one is what's the product line, what's the size of the company, some of the general business uh, questions, but also would they be willing to participate in an advisory body for the university? Again, advisory bodies are something we take for granted. We've got advisory bodies for about everything here. Over there, this is a novel concept. And so, again, sometimes you can take ideas, uh, pitch ideas and take them over there, and, and this is very good. But it, it's very good. So we set up an agribusiness advisory group. We brought people from the pi private sector who were more than willing participate in this. It was actually, that was something I, I, I didn't expect, but they wanted to be involved. They were flattered to be involved, to be part of the, the university advisory group. So we brought them in, we formed this agribusiness advisory, we revised their curriculum. What we wanted was a two-year master's degree program in agribusiness management, two years with a uh, writing a case study uh, rather than a, a theoretical thesis orientation, we want a very practical degree program that lasted two years. We developed um, local business case studies. Again, you can talk about Procter & Gamble, you can talk about large companies, U.S. companies, <coughs> excuse me, but it doesn't resonate over there. We did, so we developed uh, business case studies. In fact, one of our case studies that we developed on Shambani uh, Dairy, uh, which over a lot of places in Africa, the local folks like to drink fermented milk. Uh, I never developed the taste for it. All my years in Swaziland or Southern Africa, you'll, you'll go there, you'll, you'll, you'll see. I, uh, did you, did you, even in Ghana, I'm sure they've got, uh, all over Africa, they drink fermented milk. And so that's what the, this guy graduated from Sokoen. He started up his own company. He was using milk produced by the Maasai, which is our pastoral people over there. And uh, he made a great company out of it. Okay. And um, we also work with them to improve their internship program. They don't call them internships, they call them attachments. So we did those things and that was our model for that particular project. When I was over there, I actually ran into Pat Whittington in a lecture, like in a conference room there. Yeah. Expecting it? I found out about it like Friday and this was like on Tuesday. <laughs> about yeah. what? Okay. Pat being there. Oh, okay. <laughs> being yeah. at um, Sokoyeni, the yeah, same yeah. I was. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. Pat was also at Edgerton University mm -hmm. too. Yeah. yeah. And he was with me at Punjab Ag University in India. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So Pat Whittington has gone around and, and taught them about our internship program. So they can adapt what is useful to them. Yeah, he did. He, he does, does really nice work. He's got a lot of experience. Some of their attachment programs uh, need Pat desperately. So, anyways, we had uh, several succession projects, and then we've got we 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 had this major project for the last six years called the Innovative Agriculture Research Initiative, and this is also in Tanzania, and uh, it was a large project, the largest international project that the college has ever had, a twenty-five million dollar project funded by USAID. Uh, the overarching goal was to improve food security and agricultural productivity. But really the, the, the purpose here was to strengthen the training research capacities of Sokoweni University of Agriculture and the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries. Um, we had four major objectives to do collaborative research, to provide advanced degree training for 135 Tanzanian graduate students, to strengthen the capacity of Sokoweni to do its, you know, you know, instructional research and outreach programs, and then to build these global linkages between Sokoini and the ministry and even regional partners. Um, the major stakeholders, there's that Sokoini, the University of Agriculture, and then the ministry were our major 
partners, uh, uh, local partners in this whole thing. And we had five U.S. university partners. We couldn't train 135 people at Ohio State University. Wouldn't want to and couldn't anyways because, because the TOEFL requirements, uh, the, the English language requirements uh, at a lot of our universities, we, we had to chop around a lot of folks. But anyways, we were the lead, Ohio State was the lead university and prime contractor. RUFORM is called as an acronym that stands for the Regional University Forum for Capacity Building and Agriculture, but it's a consortium of 80 African universities. And so, uh, and it's run by a guy who did his PhD in plant pathology here at Ohio State University. And so they've been a great partner to work with. Uh, just uh, moving uh, quickly here, we have the, 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 the project was managed out of uh, the IPA office. We call that our management entity. But we also had a project management unit in at Sokoini University. And the, the project director was our faculty member from Ag, uh, Econ, uh, Dave Crable. And we had a, a whole staff and office over there. And just going out to some of the results, we did manage to train 135 people, uh, 115 MS and, and what is that, 20 PhDs. Uh, all the trainees returned home. There's some, some people say, well, the problem is you bring you know, students over here and then they won't return home. All our students returned home and are back there now. Um, and uh, we had 50% of the placements of our students were women. And we, we, take, uh, we took a lot of pride in that because uh, getting women involved over there was, a, was a, a goal of ours and of USAID, but it's always a little bit difficult to, to achieve because women have children at an earlier age there and getting them to leave behind the families is not easy. But that's why we did placements within uh, the region in, in Eastern and Southern Africa too, so that women would have easier access to coming home and making sure that everything was okay with the, with the families. We did the, the, the uh, collaborative research. We started off our collaborative research effort by doing this uh, uh, assessment of the Tanzanian food system. From that assessment, we developed our research themes and we went through this collaborative process where you, we re released uh, RFPs, requests for proposals to uh, people at our five U.S. university partners and also Sokoene. So you had to have a partner from Sokoene, you had to have a partner from the, one of the U.S. universities to be, you know, to be, uh, uh, to be uh, competitive for one of these, to receive one of these research grants. Um, we, we completed 12 of these collaborative research projects and, you know, they were either led by the, the people from Sokoene or the ministry or led by OSUC, that's OSU consortium, that's our five U.S. university partners. And we had five of the projects led by women. Again, uh, very successful. We developed a lot of proto-technologies, but the impacts of these technologies of agricultural research uh, the direct impacts on food security. Uh, that's a, another thing to measure and, and takes a little bit of time. We also got involved in what we call institutional capacity development. What we found at Sokoini when we first got there is that it wasn't very change oriented. It had kind of withdrawn. It was, you know, kind of, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't moving forward. In, in fact, as an example, they had developed a strategic plan four years before our project started and hadn't implemented anything in the strategic plan. They just weren't just moving on. So our project director over there, Dave Crable, came up with this whole idea of how do you get, how do you jumpstart change? And he, he came up with this idea of organizational experiments and that where faculty could come to him and say, here's my idea, okay, develop a, a little concept note on it. He'd look at funding it to bring about organization, to just try something, to get some things moving. And it developed about 23 of these uh, experiments. And uh, they were in a number of, of areas. We had a, he started up a university-owned private company to manage their, their land assets. He started up, up an income generation unit to 
help the departments manage some of their income generation. Like they, they, in their soils department, they were doing soils testing and they were trying to charge money, but it wasn't really, the business model really wasn't there. So this unit helped them develop a business model so that you could sustain the whole thing. You could buy supplies and keep the whole thing going. We developed a, uh, we developed a, we helped them modify their English language training, which was desperately needed. Tanzania, they had emphasized Kiswahili, which is nice, very important, uh, but the problem is, is it doesn't allow you to, uh, you know, if you're gonna be a research uh, university of tomorrow, you, you, you've gotta be involved in the English language training, so we, we upgrade, help upgrade their English language program. Another uh, program we got involved with involved Andy Gerd, who's our advancement officer. Well, he was a former, formerly over an alumni of Bear. And their deputy vice chancellor came to me one day and said, uh, he was over here and he said, I'd like to meet with your alumni people. I'm thinking, gosh, Ohio State University Alumni Association, this is major, I mean, that's big business. And I said, it's application to Sokoina. I didn't quite see it, but I said, I, I had known this guy, Andy, who was over there and he had uh, worked in Uganda. So I called him up and said, hey, would you mind meeting with these people? And we went over there and took him over there and Andy had this great store. We took Andy and, and sent him over to Tanzania, totally revitalized their whole alumni program. They call it convocation for some reason. Uh, I don't know the origins of that, but revitalized that, the whole organization. So it was one of those things where I kind of looked at it and said, this idea is not gonna work. And then it, it really did. So we had, those were a number of our organizational experiences. And the, the, the project's now over. It was a very successful project, but there's still some uh, remaining challenges. We need to improve work on those linkages with the private sector. We need to work on uh, outreach programming needs to be enhanced. Outreach extension programs are not originally part of these universities. Uh, but the, the universities now want to get involved in extension and outreach. They think they need to do this, and I agree with them. They need this to be more relevant. They just can't be an ivory tower. And so how do they do that? Well, you know, th this is something that we, we, we're, we're working with them uh, on how to develop their outreach and extension programs. And then they need to also look at alternative funding sources because a lot of uh, all universities all over the world, you just can't de depend on government funding. Okay. With that said, I'm going, and since Kelly's telling me that I need to, uh, I'm gonna move on way beyond, and I'm going to conclude. Okay, and this is uh, just a, I, I know you, Kelly's probably gone over a lot of these things with you, but uh, you know, the, the goal of the, the, uh, the, the Global Option Program is to enhance your global competencies and to make you better prepared to work and live in this global environment. And that's very good. It, but I see several of those competencies when I looked over them that could kind of be encompassed in what I call this notion of cultural versatility. The ease of entering and adjusting to new cultural situations. By the way, cross-cultural training, uh, there's a lot of major corporations invest a lot of money in cross-cultural corporations. So these global competencies are a very real thing and there's People who do training, companies before they send people overseas, they're investing time and money in training people to be globally competent and to be cross-culturally versatile. But when I, when I use this versatility, I'm talking about entering and adjusting new cultural situations. This is something you're going to be doing the rest of your life. You know, when you come to a university, you're entering a new cultural situation. When you take a job, you're entering a new cultural situation. When I enter this uh, classroom, I'm entering a new cultural situation. When you get married, uh, you know, you, that's a new cultural situation. And so what you want to do is by enhancing these, uh, the, this, the, this, the, your competencies, uh, is that's gonna help you move in and out of these new cultural situations. And some of the keys to this is, is taking an interest asking questions, remaining open, and being willing to make some mistakes. Whenever you go into another culture, some people get so uptight about doing the wrong thing that I, I think that that can be a, that, that 
can prevent you from experiencing the culture. And I often get back to the old golden rule, if you remember that one, do unto others as you would have others do to you. It's such a simple, but it is a perfect cross-cultural rule. If you treat other people with respect, if you take an interest in them, who doesn't like to have people take interest in them? Everybody, the whole world does. These are great cross-cultural rules. Uh, I always like to, wherever, if I start working in a new country, one of the first things I do is I go out and start reading the history of that country. If you, can, if you know something about a culture and a people before you go there, you're going to enjoy it so much more and you're gonna understand it so much more. So that's my little, that's my little sermon here this morning. The more this entering of new cultural situations that you do, the easier it will become. And so get involved here. You're already involved through this, the, the, the Global Option Program. I think it's, it's a real tribute that you, you've got this thing up and running. That's great. You've all done or will be doing the study abroad. They've all that, done at least one. That's fantastic. But remember, you, you don't have to go overseas to also to be involved in uh, different cultural situations. This training, though, I, I mean, I'm, my international interest is a product of a study abroad program uh, a long time ago in, in, in Kenya. And I don't think there's any better education than going over to another country. It just, for some reason, it comes, a lot of things come alive to you. But you can also get involved here. And one of the things I'm just going to say is, you know, we've got all these international students around here. I think if you take advantage and, and get to know some of those, the, these people in your classroom, they might be a little shy at first, but I don't think it, you'll ever regret it. And I know that those international students, that's another way just to locally to get involved. But also I would say to you, if you really want to put these global competencies to work, there's that, that, that Peace Corps is a real opportunity to really see and, and put not only your, your background, but also these global competencies to work. And I say that as a former Peace Corps recruiter myself. Uh, but uh, it is one of the few ways. There's other opportunities. There's uh, some uh, church-related. There's a few other uh, opportunities out there. But Peace Corps is alive and well, and it, it, it's a real opportunity for you. I think I'll wrap on that. Okay, perfect. But if you have any questions, I know I move rather fast and, and, and disjoint, but I would I'd certainly be willing to take some questions if you have any. All right, guys, I'm going to stop the recording now. So you guys have a good one.